Okay, so we're going to get started. Hi, my name is Samantha Martin. I'm a senior at Brown. And welcome to our Fashion at Brown's first sustainability conference. Um, this is our second event of the conference. And I would like you to join me in welcoming Kathleen Talbot, the um, the Chief Sustainability Offer Officer of Reformation, and um, Natalia Brown, one of our co-presidents of Fashion at Brown. And we're excited to talk with Kathleen about everything sustainability and ref. So yeah, let's all well, welcome them. All right. Good evening, everyone. I hope uh, we're good wherever. Hello, <laughs> regardless of um, where you are in the world. Um, we hope you are doing well. And I am really excited to kick this conversation off with Kathleen to learn more about Reformation and their sustainability practices. Um, Kathleen, do you want to talk to us a little bit about yourself? Give us your um, little spiel, like who you are, where you grew up, and um, maybe something fun that you're doing right now. Cool. Yeah. Um, thanks for having me. Um, and great to, to be a part of your guys' first conference. Um, I'm Kathleen Talbot. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer and VP of Operations at Reformation. Um, I've been with the company um, for nine years, um, so approaching um, a decade at the brand, and I've really had the privilege of um, leading all of our impact um, strategy and, and work um, since, since the startup days. So it's been just such um, a fun ride and excited to share more about that with you all today and, and answer any questions. Um, I'm originally from um, the Seattle, Washington area. So I um, grew up on an island um, that's just a short ferry ride from Seattle. My family is now um, a few hours north in Bellingham, Washington. So in some ways fit the like, you know, crunchy sustainability, neo hippie mold. Um, love the Pacific Northwest, still consider that like my heart home. Um, but I've been in Los Angeles for the last 12 years um, and um, yeah, I really love um, what I get to do here. And frankly, love the sunshine too. So um, <laughs> I've grown adjusted to a different climate. Um, one of the things um, most excited about professionally is really um, pushing the boundary of what it means to be a sustainable company, which I know we're going to talk about in some of the conversation, uh, Natalia, but um, especially as it relates to some of like um, the concepts of circularity and, and again, kind of what's the next frontier, what's the next future when we think about sustainable fashion. So that's like taking most of my mind space and frankly, more of my creative energy right now. And I think that's fun and exciting and hard. Um, and then on the personal front, um, I'm in the process of growing a human. So um, I'm, I'm pregnant with my second kiddo and um, just really focused on, um, yeah, taking, taking care um, and, and managing that on the, on the personal front. Oh my God. Congratulations. Uh, talk about doing it all. Um, <laughs> that's really incredible. Wow. Um, and that also sounds really fun. I have, yeah, just a lot of questions from that speaking as a born and raised in Miami girl. Um, the sunlight is yeah, the, op the opposite ends of the, <laughs> I know it's something I will never tire of and I am missing every single day here. Um, but Let's get into, I guess, what does it mean to be a sustainable company? Um, I think we're going to go over a little bit of Reformation's timeline. We could also start with that if that feels more natural to you, but definitely want to push uh, into, yeah, how do you guys first and foremost tackle sustainability? I know the company was started in 20, uh, 2009, and so you joining five years, uh, I did my math correct, five years after um, its founding, that's pretty incredible. And I know in 2013, a lot of big things also happened in terms of establishing certain um, sustainability uh, progresses or I'm forgetting the word right now, policies. So if you can just um, describe, you know, like entering into reformation in 2014, what did sustainability mean to you then? And then how have you either adjusted your definition or um, further practiced that? Yeah, I think that at the highest level, 
sustainability is like almost like a, a philosophy, right? We're talking about how do we how do we live lives and how do we operate businesses in a way that respects the natural limits, right? Like that's the almost like academic definition of sustainability. And so I think if you keep that as your anchor, um, what changes is more about like what, what's available, right? In terms of technology and solutions and the how. Um, and I think that has been a really incredible um, thing to observe within the fashion industry and, and that, has shown up in different ways as in different stages within the REF journey for sure. So we could talk through that pretty quickly, but um, we were founded in 2009. The first Reformation store was actually um, a brick and mortar retail store here in Los Angeles. Um, our founder would go up and source um, one of a kind vintage um, and then had a, a small pattern room basically and then a sample room in the back of the store where they would refresh retailer reimagine some of those pieces sew them reform them um mm -hmm. and then and then um sell those um in the front of the shop so the very first reformation store was in 2009 and was in that concept so really this idea of almost like upcycled fashion and using what already exists um, and I think that's always been at the, the, the ethos of the brand. Um, it's a great place to start from a sustainability perspective. We always say like nothing's more sustainable than vintage or using what already exists. And so I think that was such a such an incredible legacy, continues to be an, a, an incredible legacy for a brand like Ref. As the the brand grew and as um, the demand and the brand awareness grew for this product, it quickly turned into how do we make vintage inspired and classic silhouettes and parts of our closets basically that weren't really being serviced by sustainable fashion at the time. Most of it was really basics. Um, so how do you have like an event dress or like a sexy top <laughs> that um, also feels like it's like aligned with sustainability values and some of this ethos of reuse. Um, and so we were creating new styles was still sort of that design sensibility, that vintage inspired sensibility um, and making them using dead stock materials. So dead stock is a little bit of industry jargon, but it's basically like overordered or excess materials. So not materials that you're developing or customizing um, within the brand. Um, so when I joined in 2014, we were still about at that stage. We were primarily a vintage and dead stock business. We were producing everything within our own um, factory here in Los Angeles. Um, and we had a few stores um, and we're just launching an online business. So it was still fairly early in that, um, the, the business, the business um, uh, stage, if you want. So my role originally was to say like, okay, so you have, I have a background in sustainability. I don't have a background in, in business or, or fashion. Um, the idea was like, okay, you're the sustainability expert. You can take these different frameworks and sustainability strategies and apply it to a business and help us reimagine what a fashion company should be if we do, do get to kind of start from the ground up. We always say like, it's a little bit different to be like born good versus be a brand that's trying to like retrofit and, you know, adjust kind of what's maybe a heritage brand that's been doing something for a hundred years, so much harder, right, to, to institute some of those changes. So our founder, again, was saying, we have this opportunity to build something different, challenge the status quo, really turn some of these things on its head. Like, how can you help inform that from a sustainability perspective? And so... Um, in the very early days, it's also, we were in startup mode. So it's also like, you know, less resources, smaller teams, like having to be scrappy and us all wearing lots of different hats. Um, but for, for me, that meant really, if we want to grow and scale, we have to start developing some of our own materials. What would be the actual lowest impact, most innovative, most kind of transformative things that we can source? Um, that still go back to this like founding ethos of prioritizing reuse, what's already out there and, and really driving for things that we feel like are aligned with, you know, appropriate climate action and, you know, lots of other impacts on people on the planet. So most of what I did right out the gate was focused on like material sourcing and, and, and standards. And then similarly, we were just starting to produce outside of our own factory. 
So it was how do you safeguard what that means for the brand, our commitment to workers and to fair labor, and how do you create a, to your point you earlier, you mentioned policies, like how do you create policy standards and programs that let you do that as you grow? And so those were probably the two things that um, were real focus areas when we were defining what does sustainable fashion mean? It was like right. most of our impact, environmental impact happens at the material stage. So that's where you have to start. And then obviously fashion has a huge human impact, particularly in workers in your supply chain. So how do we put that at the center? Um, today, we're officially a large company. Um, we have you know, nearly 40 stores. We have a, a very large online business. Um, about a thousand employees. Um, and I'm really proud of the fact that we did take some of these foundations and successfully grow and scale them and, and really try to keep our core and that DNA um, intact. Um, and for us, sustainability now means achieving climate positivity. So that is going beyond neutral, we've been climate neutral for a long time, <laughs> um, going beyond neutral to say, how do we actually reduce our emissions in line with the science and then remove more emissions from the atmosphere than we produce each year um, and then go circular, you know, really truly take some of the things that were our legacy um, as, as starting as a vintage company and really integrate it into our business model, into our product and into how we engage our consumers and make sure that our stuff actually stays in the fashion system. And I think if we can achieve those things together, um, that goes back to like your initial, initial question of like, what does sustainable fashion mean? Like to me, that's a fashion system that can sustain and can self-perpetuate and live within and operate within um, our natural or at natural limits. So that's like, that's the new North Star. Yeah, no, that was a beautiful definition and so well thought out. Um, I think it's really incredible how your brand has been able to stick to their roots um, as using what already exists. And I think that's a really great philosophy that the brand has continued to perpetuate. But I also really love how um, the people component also came in once the company started scaling and how um, fashion and it speaks to how fashion really is a unique intersection between using uh, the world and its resources, but also involving um, so many people that uh, many times uh, you can't even say who made your clothes, yeah. right? Um, and I think your company definitely tries to answer a lot of those like questions or be able to. And um, which leads into, I guess, a question for those who may not know a lot of like industry jargon, what exactly does um, fashion circularity mean? And um, I know it's been, it's always, it's a word that's used a lot with resale. Um, so can you tell us, yeah, a little bit about that in more technical terms and then how that also relates to reformations practices? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for those of you that want to like really nerd out on this, um, I encourage you to look into the Ella MacArthur Foundation um, because they have some really helpful tools and trainings on, on circularity, not just in the fashion industry, but but really as a concept. And we borrow um, we borrow their principles and definitions because I think it's important for us to also standardize some of this and all be kind of speaking the same language and, and working towards the same things because it's not just about reformation doing this perfectly, right? It's about how do we as an industry start to... Um, start to make this pivot and, and move to, to more circular and frankly, like future proof models. And so um, they define circularity um, as achieving three principles. The first is to eliminate waste and pollution. Um, and so this is like where it starts in my mind. So this is where like a lot of our efforts are actually in, but might not be the first things you think of when you think about circularity, especially if you're associating it with resale. Um, so this is really planning, designing, producing smarter so that you create less waste in the first place. You guys might understand this, especially given, I think, the room, right? These are people that have an interest in, in, in fashion, but um, up to some estimates say um, up to 30% of what brands and the industry produces never actually gets to the customer, right? So that's waste even before it gets to the customer. Um, and so obviously that's not good for business, right? That's, that's liability. Those are things that affect your profitability, um, but it also um, 
just underscores the fact that we're, we're inherently creating waste um, in most of our, our business processes today. So our goal here is really designing out waste at every stage of production. And then we wanna keep using materials that are safe for people on the planet. Um, and so this is this idea again of, you know, we don't want to be um, using toxic polluting processes, right? So this is where focusing on clean chemistry as it relates to dyeing and finishing and other things within the industry is so critical because if, you'll, we'll get to this in a minute, but if our goal is to keep materials in constant circulation, if it's toxic, in, it's going to be toxic and stay at that infinity loop, right? You want our skin and have in our, have in our homes and in our natural environment. The second principle is circulating products and materials. So this is maybe a little bit more like what you first think of, Natalia, when you think about circularity. So this is keeping your stuff around for a long time. Um, you know, this includes things like durability and quality. This is collecting textile waste at every step of the way and making sure that that gets back into um, material processes. And then um, this is also to making cool things out of recycled materials, right? So how do you actually bring in recycled inputs um, into, into, into your products? Um, and then the last is um, another, another word that's being used a lot when you talk to folks about sustainability in the industry. But the third principle is regenerating nature. Um, so for us, this is an idea of like your big why goes back to what you said, like, what do you, what do you think sustainability means? This is your big why. We want to be regenerating nature. We want to be doing things that are restorative and that are, are um, actually mimicking some of our natural processes. And so for us, this means that we continue to operate in a way that's climate positive, um, you know, shift to truly renewable and regenerative practices, especially for any virgin materials that you use. Um, and then investing really in thinking about, yeah, like just your total net impact. Um, and um, that's just one of the things that I think is so critical. So in this, in this framework, circularity means that you're sourcing clean, regenerative or recycled materials. You're making products that are meant to last and frankly keep cycling in different uses. So whether that be also alternative models like rental, resale, or um, you know, exchange. And then you actually have solutions to once those products are done with their use of the life of getting back into the material stream. Okay. Oh. And in your experience, what have um what have been the ups and downs of trying to have a uh, practice all of those things um i guess we can get nitty-gritty like are there any fabrics or materials that are harder to uh work with or make a uh, sustainable or source um yeah yeah i think it's i think there's challenges definitely at, at, at every step of this because um, it's still just so fringe within the industry. Like these, these are concepts. These aren't practices in most cases and for most brands. I think that on the material side, there's so much more available. Um, this is the stuff that I just like love to talk about. Um, that I think we're, we're, we're doing some, we're having such great progress in, in the last few years when it comes to material innovation. I think that we've come so far from recycled materials just being mechanically recycled cottons, you know, that then like don't perform the same way you expect or want. Um, you know, there's incredible technology now that's taking agricultural waste and textile waste and spinning um, beautiful fiber and fabrics um, and that, you know, we'd want to wear. Because again, I think one of the things that Reformation has really tried to showcase is like, it should still be desirable product. It should still be fashionable product. Um, so it feels like there's some really good unlocks happening on the material side, but a lot of that's still new, hasn't hit scale on commerciality yet. And um, we have a long ways to go as an industry. I think that, um We've done, we've had actually recycling programs and resale programs for many years. We launched our first rough recycling program in 2014 when I started. Um, and uh, yeah, our thread up program, Sam, um, 
in 2018. And so we found like great success working with partners and trying to connect our customers with those solutions and incentivize our customers to do that. So in both cases, you can participate, you can clean out your closet and actually get ref credit. Um, if you have ref product that can no longer be worn or resold, you can send it to us and we'll actually give you credit to recycle it and they'll stay in the fashion system. So it's not just again, going to kind of a generic recycling question mark uh, solution, but but really trying to stay into um, our supply chain. Um, so we've had some really good proof of concepts for like some of these alternative models, but it's um, there's still so much to do. And this is also one where it's like, we can do so much as a brand, but we also want to drive more engagement, more awareness and more um, of that kind of consumer mindset to do those things first. Um, most of the clothing in the U.S. is still being thrown out. Um, like that's just the reality. Um, so how do we how do we um, engage a consumer and, and how do we make this stuff easier and 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 frankly, um, uh, more more compelling to participate in? And then I think the last thing would be. Um, yeah, just that recycling infrastructure. It's not just that the consumer is like not willing to participate. It's just that it's a lot harder than it is to do a lot of other recycle other waste streams. And so there's a there's a need for better infrastructure. There's a need for better regulation on some of this stuff. So again, our our focus has really been on how do we solve some of these problems and fill some of these gaps not in a way that just serves the reformation brand, but is actually creating a platform or creating solutions for the industry or for more brands. So um, we relaunched our ref recycling program actually last year with the partner called Super Circle. And the idea is that that's someone who can sort and aggregate um, textiles and, and garments to be recycled across brands um, and that we can actually do this work so much better if we're not all trying to do it ourselves. And so, um, that's one that, again, I'm really proud of. I think it's um, the right foundations to help us realize like some of these circularity principles at scale. Yeah, no, thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to ask more about how these processes and programs do align with being a, a business and a corporation, how like it may be difficult um, or even how competition plays into it. Because I think uh, now a lot of brands also want to be sustainable. Um, it's a very big trend, you may say, even though it has been um, the ethos of you guys for forever. Um, so in trying to create a platform that actually serves many different brands and actually pushes the industry forward in many ways, do you ever sense that um, there is any competition or that um, where other brands are trying to be more more sustainable and push themselves to be that way. Although I feel like you guys, in, at least in, in the U.S., you guys are leading uh, the pack by a, by a lie, in, I feel. But have you felt uh, that sense of competition? And also, has there been a struggle to uh, make this concept of recycling and circularity compelling for your customers? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I would say that when we first started, we would always say like, we it did feel lonely, right? Like there wasn't a lot of brands that were in the space, especially again, ones that we would consider um, like more relevant to our product category and our, and our brand position. There's been a lot more in some of like the activewear space. So, you know, out there aware. Um, I would say we've, we've built a lot of incredible partners over the years, both formally and informally. Um, we do work across a lot of these different industry groups that let you connect kind of pre-competitively um, and align on strategies and, and consider how do you do what's going to make the most impact in a way that should kind of lift all lift all boats. Um, so I think like working with groups like the Textile Exchange or the Sustainable Apparel Coalition, um, we're part of the UN Fashion Charter. Uh, we're also brand members of Fashion for Good, which quite literally connects brands to co-invest in some of these things that are early stage. And frankly, like usually that's even more competitive, right? You want to be the brand that's helping bring something to market. And we're doing that as collectives for the first time, which I just think is so cool. Um, so I think there's some really good 
work um, happening across the industry. To your point, it's including a lot of the big players, um, a lot of the multinational brands, um, as well as smaller and um, kind of more like mission oriented brands like Graph. And I think seeing where those come together is such an interesting um, an interesting evolution too. Um, I would say our commitment is ultimately on setting a standard. So um, if anything, the fact that it has gotten noisier, like everybody's making green claims and some of them feel cool and like progress and some of them might not feel as authentic, you know, um, we've decided like that's a challenge and that's a good challenge to say, how do you maintain leadership? Um, so if this was something that's so important to us, like how, do, if, if hopefully that just sharpens us, right? It just makes us even, even more focused on how do we set a standard? How do we keep pushing the limits of what's possible? And how do we prove that you can do these things and run a successful, growing, profitable business? Um, and I think that to me is like our best proof point. If we can succeed as a business, we in some ways can change the narrative that the stuff is too hard or it's too expensive or you can't you can't do it at scale um and so I think that to me is more about like the challenge and kind of how we see our role um, and like how do you influence and bring people along in this revolution because if we're serious about wanting to make an impact we want and need a lot of the industry to follow right um so yes, it's, some of that can feel at odds if like that's our brand position or something, but I, I think we have to think a little bit bigger than that. Yeah. And has, um, I guess a lot of people, um, or there's an attitude where sustainability means uh, not producing anymore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's always something that whenever I've uh, approached fashion and sustainability, it's also, you know, a mini crisis in your head where like, okay, maybe like I do have to use what exists, but like, you know, the, the customer wants more, especially now I think um, in there, we are in an era of consumerism. And I think every um, brand and company wants to keep up with that. And I feel like there is a desire to as, as well, it's human nature. So how, how um, would you, I guess, personally as well, like, how do you think about, um, about that idea of, you know, like buying less, but then also really uh, striving to be a company that's profitable, profitable while mm -hmm. also knowing that, you know, profitability doesn't always uh, mean just producing more, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I guess personal philosophies and then also, you know, how you have um, approached that in your work at Ref. Yeah, I think it's an it's an, it's a critical it's a critical question to ask if you want to be thinking about like what does responsible consumerism look like? I am like far from like the 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 the, the end of the spectrum that's like degrowth, you know, the true um the true sense of like we need to start sacrificing the basics like I just I just part of me is very pragmatic and I just don't see that as being um something that's ever going to go beyond the fringe and so I'd rather focus on again how do you influence and inspire responsible consumption right like caring for your stuff better knowing that like sometimes it's it's like fewer better things and and some of these other like tag links that I'm sure you're starting to hear around um particularly fashion in your closet um, I practice a type of minimalism in my life. Um, I am very thoughtful about what comes into my closet and I am like incredibly methodical about how I clean um, up and what goes into resale cycles and stuff after. Um, so I think there's ways to do it in a very like conscious way um, without, again, it feeling like you have to sacrifice style or self-expression or new clothes if you need and want new clothes. So I think there's there's that 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 balance. Um at Ref, I think there's also this um very clear acknowledgement that we're a fashion company. We're making clothes and we're making new clothes and including a certain amount of trend. Um, I think that's incredibly important because if you're not doing that within this kind of sustainable business model, your customer's just going to get that from a fast fashion retailer or, you know, again, from, um, from another outlet that's not going to have hopefully this, this net positive impact. 
So when I think about our growth and the products we're putting out there, we're at a size and a, a scale that I think like our growth is disruptive of, of other, of, of, of like the alternative. And maybe that's a little bit of wishful thinking, but I, I, that's genuinely kind of how I'm, I'm, I'm processing it. And then our focus again is if you're building with circularity in mind, it's quality, it's durable. You're also facilitating that kind of recirculation of your, your products. Um, I think it becomes quite defensible. Um, like, and not just to help you sleep at night way, but like, this is the way it should work. Like, this is the way we want fashion to be. It's a vision of what something that's good um, and better, not, um, you know, not, not the alternatives. So I think that's how I've, I've been thinking about our role as a brand. Mm -hmm. We do have a platform, right? And so I think being able to also start to normalize some of the stuff, like it used to be disgusting to shop shop thrift like you know even 10 years ago like that was a really hard message to tell people to buy second hand like we've seen that change culturally so much and now it's totally legitimate to say shop our vintage shop if you know that's more right. values aligned or you know like how do you make sure that you have a certain amount of second hand as a percent of your closet or something like these like just little challenges and little reminders and normalizing that I think is also really important yeah, no, that um, definitely agree. Like I remember growing up through the whole shift in secondhand and now it's all anybody can ever talk about here. Um, and I also think there is something to say about the fashion and beauty industries in general where they've uh, propelled human society for as long as we can remember. And that I think they are um, facts of life that will always be present. I mean, we always see in all of these like reports and everything how those industries just don't die um and I think your stance on perfecting and improving your role in that industry rather than diminishing your presence in it due to being more sustainable is a really um <clears throat> good approach that I think many others um could and should follow um so yeah and um, now I want to move on to how, so you, so you joined in the startup phases and now you're part of this entire movement. And I think um, as we were speaking earlier, like Reformation has a huge set of followers who are absolutely obsessed. And it's, it is a brand with a, a great platform and has uh, achieved a lot of fame, I would say, you know, social media, you guys are very well known. Um, how has it felt personally to be a part of this movement and like kind of almost be a part of, uh, or the reason why, you know, one of the reason, many reasons why this brand has now become like a celebrity brand almost. Um, like, you, you know, I guess like working, um, yeah, like I know many of us, like our students and like want to know how it feels to be in either like big careers or um, careers and they want to be in spaces that like make an impact. So how has that journey like felt, yeah. been and felt? I mean, it still feels a little bit surreal, but also like um, incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, it's something I always say I'm like a terrible millennial because I've been here for so long. Um, but I genuinely love my job and I love the brand and I love my team and I'm so proud of the work and the commitment um and showing up every day like with that kind of like something in your belly that's like let's go after the hard stuff still like let's keep proving it out let's keep let's keep driving for for the most impact like that's a great place to be if especially if you have sustainability in your title um and so um yeah, I mean, I'm just really grateful to have the opportunity to to do this work um, and to do this with such an incredible team. I think I still pinch myself when I think about, again, just kind of the platform and the influence side. Um, and like, we've done some campaigns that are frankly, like super provocative and um, I think really fun. And the fact that we get to do that here and, and even like our board is just so supportive and um, really wants us to keep testing the boundaries like that's that's just been that's been a real frankly like a gift um of a career and so um just feeling super motivated um 
And I think that the one thing that, I mean, again, maybe it makes sense to this group too, but the one thing I didn't think about when I started the role is like how much influence you'd have outside of the company. Um, obviously, I wanted to lead and my focus is still leading my team here first and foremost. Like how do I influence change here and have this be super genuine to any refs experience? But um, the work that we get to do with like some of the groups I mentioned, like Fashion for Good, like that's such a different space. And I'm talking to, um, you know, chemical engineers and like innovators and like just such a different space and realizing that like we actually can use our resources now, whether that be capital, whether that be purchasing power, all these things to like actually do some cool shit. Like that yeah. feels like the next, the next um you know, stage or whatever um, of of my career and my influence at REF. And that also just like feels awesome, like super empowering. And um, we get to meet some really inspiring um, leaders and, and innovators in the process. So that's, that's also really cool. No, I bet. Um, and I feel, I wish everyone here on this call gets to have a career that makes them feel that way. Um, and going off of what you said, what have been some of your favorite partnerships or favorite people to have met through your work? And Oh, that's so hard. <laughs> I can't, it's like, it's like, you can't pick you can, a favorite. You can, give, you can give us a list. We are here for all the content in the world. <laughs> um, you can't pick a favorite. I'm just going to pick two at random just to give you like a full range. Um, we're based in Los Angeles. Um, early, early on in my career, I reached out to, um, the leadership team at Patagonia and just said like, I'm totally new to this. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, would you guys be willing to chat? And um, Vincent Stanley you should look him up. He's like, has YouTube videos and stuff. He's written some books. Vincent Stanley is like their head of mission or something. Yeah. Um, he's like an old, uh, you know, old school Patagonia leader. Um, he has become such a, a beloved friend and mentor. We spend a lot of time. He always connected me to people on their team over the years. We have such close relationships with so many of them. And um, it really helped open my eyes on what was possible. And again, kind of having that provocative brand um, position and being willing to just chart a new path. And so I would say a lot of the folks at Patagonia, but particularly Vincent Stanley for me, that was really impactful because that was, you know, literally like in my first six months on the job and we still have maintained such close partnerships over the years and totally informally, right? Like we sell some of their stuff on our website, but like, this is all stuff that is just like between, between friends, basically. Um, I think the other, and this is a new one, we just actually um, launched a pilot with um, an innovator um, called Ruby, R-U-B-I. Um, and you should also look them up. They are two at, uh, twin founders total like badass women that you should like you just have to see their photo and you're like what um and they are doing like carbon capture and then spinning fiber <laughs> wow. um okay. so doing um like fiber innovation but in a you know a, a climate positive way and still all at the lab scale but like these are the sorts of things that again like really like light my fire and just get me so excited for the future um, and that's a new partnership. We're doing a pilot with them this year. Um, and you should definitely check them out. No, the first thing I will do after this call, then I'm all in town to see badass women doing anything. Um, that, no, that sounds awesome. Do you, do you have any more like things that you are excited to see in the future? Like, um, any more brands or things that you guys are innovating, um, that, you are excited looking forward to oh my gosh there's so many things um I think a lot of it is still in the material space because I think there's just still so much room for innovation so I think Ruby's a great example but like how do we look at really just new ways to to produce textiles that aren't as um land resource chemical intensive um, so I think there's a lot of work happening right now about how you take different waste streams and, and, um, again, kind of spend new fiber. And those to me are, are super, super interesting. Um, so we're doing a lot of work in that space. Um, but I think, um, that's another like kind of key to unlocking circular, like more circular models in my mind. I think that, 
other things. I don't, this is like not new at yeah. all, but I think it's super important. It's like you talked earlier about like, how do you get more of the customers to actually want to participate in some of these programs? Like, what does it look like? Like just keeping tests, like keep testing our communications and our engagement. And like, how do we, how do we talk about repair and recovery in a way that's like actually relevant and accessible and interesting? Like, how do we start to drive more engagement in our recycling programs, like all of those things that I think are like, again, not new programs or technology, but really, I think a place where REF should set the tone because like most brands say they're struggling with this. And it's like, we have such an engaged consumer base. We have such a strong platform. How do we, how do we keep, how do we keep um, a focus there? Mm-hmm. Right. No. How do you use the impact that you do have to actually drive um, a change in consumer mindset? Which I think, yeah, is 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 kind of is kind of difficult. I think due to um, right the trend mindset and everything. Mm-hmm. Like, so I right. I guess what I'm wondering is, do you or does Ref in general like? What would you say are the most pressing questions driving you guys right now? um in terms of like driving sustainability practices with either consumer bases or just people uh in general because I know you guys have um done a lot to bring together um like just the human aspect of fashion and sustainability yeah I mean I think that there's um there's probably a few ways to go at that I think that What's interesting about the REF model is like, we didn't assume our customer was going to come to us just for sustainability, right? They're coming to us for product. They're coming for us for value. And then sustainability is like a driver for some, but not all of our customer base. But I think I am concerned like 2022, 2023 is a nice environment for that, right? Like as soon as you start to experience some inflation and some, some pressure on it, like even the consumer, even the, the younger consumer base um, that's been saying that this is so important to them in all of those, you know, consumer surveys, they're already downgrading like the value of sustainability and what they'd be willing to pay and, and all these other things. So I think that there's still like a pretty fundamental divide sometimes in terms of like, what is the value of this? Is, is even sustainability just a trend for a consumer or like, can we and should we expect that there will be a bigger cultural shift in the mindset shift? I'm like optimistic that I think it's actually here to say. It's just like, how do you still navigate some of the things that frankly feel a little fickle? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I think there's a few really clear things you can do as a fashion company that are always going to have like the win, 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 right? Like it's going to be good for the business, it's going to be good for the consumer and it also drives impact. Like resale is a great example of that. Like most of the time, a business case for resale, especially like a program that we have with ThreadUp is like a win, win, win. Like, yeah, lovely. Like do it all day long. Um, Mm -hmm. No one's mad about it. But I think um, when we start to talk about some of these other things that really challenge more of our status quo and challenge how we think about a, a, a transaction. That's where it just, again, it feels like just too new and uncharted. So like, I'll use the recycling as an example, like um, there's this like philosophical conversation going on around like, what if you didn't think about it as like, I'm buying a cotton sweater, but like, I'm actually buying, you know, 20 kilograms of cotton and like, I'll be responsible to recycle that when I'm done with it. You know, like, how do we start to make the the mindset shift right. much, much more um, focused on this idea of like, not just the transaction, not just the first transaction? Yeah, no, that's really important. And it, um, it in that even you saying that, like, oh, if I, I'm purchasing a share, I'm purchasing like X amount of this material, you know, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um and I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't even know that about most of my clothes. And I think a lot of us can say the same where like uh, sustainability sometimes, um, if you don't like 
off the bat, I think a large part of the consumer base, yeah, does not know where where their clothes comes from, nor have they uh, asked that question. I think particularly, you know, um, at least in in the U.S. and um, it's important to start shifting those conversations. And I think part of it starts, you know, not just worrying about um, clothes and your beauty products, because also clean beauty has done, has gone through the same thing. And um, it, yeah, I think it means, you know, being part of the equation that actually brings weight to um, what material objects are <laughs> in yes. the world. Like, yeah, it remind, okay. reminds you that it is that physical exchange. Um, I think that's, I mean, even when we first started launching um, Refscale, which is just like an environmental footprint calculator for all of our products, like mm -hmm. we first launched it, we launched it in 2015. Um, there was this idea of like, what do you mean? Like there's water required to make my jeans or like, it was like that new of a concept still. And I think so much of it, so much of that has become more normalized. Like we're used to thinking about it better right. resources, but um, we have to do kind of the same thing now. when we think about like the value of a product mm -hmm. besides like, again, the first, the first application of that material, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's something that like, when you get to more people, um, that argument or that uh, statement holds, uh, becomes a lot more important because uh, it, it's almost it's almost revolutionary to in someone's mind where like you know you're so used to seeing like uh, all fast fashion shops and like seeing fashion through like Instagram and it's all like trends and you want to look the best but then when you're um, when you're hit with you know okay well like where where did this come from who made it how much are you paying for it versus how much you know it it should have cost. Um, yeah. I, someone else someone else actually said in a in a meeting we were having today which is like most of our materials especially because so much of the industry is is using synthetic materials and um, synthetic materials are meant to last for thousands of years right. and most of the designs and the products that they're being put into are designed for like a hundred days of wear right so when you think about that too it's like this total mismatch right um and to me, that's still, I'm in this, I'm in these conversations all the time. To me, right. like hearing that again and like being reminded again about like, what are we trying to work against and what's our vision that's more hopeful and more interesting? Like, it's still really helpful to think about it in those terms. Like, of course, it's like, that doesn't make sense. So why is that how are this industry still works and how can we, how can we try to keep challenging and, and, and flipping some of that on its head? Yeah, no, it's a, yeah, it's still a, diff it's a difficult question, you know, but I think, yeah, it just, it takes more people, more work and the motivation, I guess, to continue, you know, staying, staying true to what you guys set out to do from the very beginning. Um, yeah, yes, a lot of things for me to think about too, after this conversation. Um, so we're wrapping up just slightly. So I want to ask um, um, slightly more like personal questions about like your you know either college experience or like work experience now if that's okay um and then also just um yeah so I think my first question is what what got you um into like sustainability um tell us what you studied in college and then in your master's and you know how how that kind of started forming your own personal north star sure um uh, I did my undergraduate in like a small local art school. I did three degrees, which is silly. Um, so I did um, international development, um, economics, and Spanish, uh, Latin American studies. Um, I thought I was going to work in nonprofits. So I was really focused on like poverty alleviation, um, primarily in Latin America, um, and um, actually worked in, in nonprofits through school. Um, in, in some ways, like the ref model of like agrarian or something, yeah. it was like, 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 how do you like really adjust something more systematically? And like, how do you work in that way? That's like really community based. And I found it really, really rewarding and interesting, but most of the problems I was studying, um, I'd actually go down, um, and do field research and things. Um, I, I realized that like I stumbled into this like field of sustainability, right? So it's like where economics 
where social issues and where business and like social enterprise comes together. Um, and so I did my graduate work actually in um, sustainability science. Mm -hmm. um, and I would did it in, at Arizona State, which is a strange place to do sustainability, like go to the desert to study uh, sustainability. But um, it was actually the first program in the States that was a multidisciplinary um, sustainability program. And I was in the second year of the program. So it was like super, super new. Like they were, they were like basically like, why don't you help develop the curriculum while, while you're in the program? But I found it like just really formative, like a, such a good experience, had great mentors, um, got to work with the National Science Foundation while I was there, did a lot of um, like pretty deep sustainability, like strategy development um, and um, consulting through that program. Um, and then I stayed in academia for a minute um, until I realized it was just too slow for me. Um, and then I wanted to work in a business environment. And that's when I actually met Yael. I met the founder of Raf and, and came over here. So um, I say like my MBA was like on the job. Um, I have learned so much about this industry and so much about the business um, and was really thoughtful about that. Like really tried to ask yeah. for mentors and like whether it was Vincent or others, like really mm -hmm. just like raise my hand and say, I'm new to the field or I'm new to this space, like what I'm, what I'm really am eager to do X, Y, and Z um, and had such support in the process, both from leaders here at Reformation, but also from other brands um, and just uh, have just, like I said, like I truly genuinely like love that work and, and love the people around me um, and I've just um, try to pay it forward now um, to a lot of young professionals and people that are in a similar position now and other brands or are working in companies that frankly aren't as supportive and trying to give them some tools and resources and, and things to, to accelerate the work that they're doing in other companies. So it's been, um, it's been a fun journey. Yeah, no, it shows. It's been a joy to see you nerd out about your career. Um, it's, I think it's very fun to, that you attended a, a master's program where you were building the plane as you were flying it. Um, yeah. And what, um, and even now uh, in your career, I guess this is more um, like something that, that I have always wanted, wanted to know. And that I do ask um, of, or I would like to ask, you know, uh, every woman in her career, you have had a really um, like successful and um, in, uh, like fulfilling um, career so far. You know, I'm sure there's more of it to come, but I guess how have you like, balanced, um, and this can be a very light answer as well, not looking for super detail, but like how have you uh, balanced motherhood with that? Like, have you been able, I guess, to feel, you know, happy as well in both and like in um what would you um what would be your advice I guess to any anyone who is like you know dealing with um like just new such newness in your life but also with um like a propelling and like really amazing um career that really lights you up yeah I think it's I think it's a good question um I have a three-year-old, a nearly three-year-old at home um, and uh, a, a pandemic baby born June 1st of 2020. So oh, wow. I sometimes say like that was in, um, in some ways a very strange silver lining of the pandemic because it did kind of change our relationship with work and like how much you needed to work yeah. in person versus what you could do remotely. And that flexibility, especially the first year of having a newborn, um, frankly, really helped. Um but I think that for me personally, it's, it's realizing that like, it's okay to have your identity so tied to motherhood and so tied to your professional life and have um, some, some overlap for sure, but feel really confident in your identity and your ability to do both. Um, I also have the privilege of working at a majority women red led company. Um, I worked right alongside our founder when she started her family. Um, I worked with our CEO for eight, eight years um, and, uh, you know, sat in pumping rooms with her, you know, for, for her two kiddos. And so I think this idea that like, it, it's normalized the idea of, of 
prioritizing your family and making sure that you create space for that while also being a results oriented, yeah. impact oriented leader. Um, it was modeled really well for me here. Um, and so it made it feel um, more achievable. Um, I think I'm also someone who has like very strong boundaries. Like the first year of my son's life, like I said, I take meetings from 10 to four um, because I wanted to really maximize the time I got with him in the mornings and in the evenings. And I wanted to be there at bedtime. And like, that was just like, for me, that was like, this is just what, this is how it is. Like, this is what, and I know I can do my job and be super capable and frankly, like exceed expectations yeah. and do less meetings in the off hours. Like that's not gonna, like, like, there's no trade-off yeah. there. And again, in an environment that like, let me do that. I felt very confident doing that. Um, so it's been, it's been good. It's been a good test of boundaries, but also again, that like comfort and the confidence in, in two identities. Right. I didn't, some people have described motherhood and I, and I, I have to assume this is actually how a lot of women feel as like, it, ch- it took over your identity and you didn't, you lost your sense of self. For me, it felt super additive. Like, I just felt like I got to be able to flex two different things. Um, and I love being a parent, like genuinely, it's like one of the things that I can't imagine not being a parent. Um, and, uh, I think there's also some of that too, right? Like you just learn what's kind of yeah. most important for you and, um, they don't have to be at odds. Mm-hmm. No, that was really amazing to hear. And it's also nice uh, to hear that you had such a like supportive community around you and definitely being in, um, a woman majority space was was a part of that. And I think um, I liked what you said about it being additive um, because also, you know, going going back, uh, I, asked, I asked the question because I think, you know, part of what makes, you know, um, sustainability possible and feasible, um, but also, you know, having a really good company is being able to invest uh, in the people who work there and like, in order to also give your best self to the company, you need to have Mm -hmm. your own um, identities um, in check, I imagine. So like being able to actually give your best by establishing, you know, like that this is also who I am now um, um, is, is really, you know, powerful because through that, you have also been able to drive the company to better um, results and better practices and um it's like it's a testament not you know to you and to like how um reformation ref like you know and I know it sounds I know it sounds hard when you're like in the school mode and still younger but it also like puts time in perspective we're like it doesn't matter (laughs) the long like the extent of it right like even if it means that I'm gonna be out for four months or you know um I'm gonna prioritize something else like in the hierarchy of things I'm gonna put my my little one above most other things for at least a season um like you realize that like doesn't really matter in the span of a career and even in a span of my work at RAF like there's seasonal fluctuations there's all these other things and like it really challenges you as a leader too to say like what what type of team do you need to build and what type of structure do you need to build so that it's not a cult of personality and it's not just that I have to do everything right um uh, so I think that's also been a really um, lovely part of that evolution and that growth as a leader and as a, as a parent. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really, um, awesome to hear. Um, so we are finishing up. So I will have, um, ask you my last question, which is, um, what, well, you've already, you've already given quite good advice, but I guess, um, what, what advice would you give to students, um, now who are um I don't um I don't know entering like into a career like a a job force you know now where there's a lot of pressure to maybe be a lot of things and adjust yourself uh to the job and like reform uh yourself to you know the job's hours um its demands and like fit in with maybe people around you to get recruited. Um, I think sometimes, you know, as undergraduates, there's a lot of pressure to either have have something figured out always. Um, 
and it can lead to uh, feeling like I need a job yesterday. And so I'm going to take anything that comes my way. Uh, but I'm also going to do anything to get there, even if it means doing something that I really dread waking up to do it every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what advice would you give to those students right now? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's so much there. I think that like, it's important to realize I know I'm being like rah, rah, rah about things that like, I think you're never going to, not you're never, it's good to manage expectations that there's going to be some part of most roles that you just do because you have to do. Um, I think like a lot of people talk about this as like an 80, 20 rule or whatever, like once it exceeds that 20%, like, is it really your calling or like, is it something that you want to sustain? Maybe not, but like also recognizing that there's going to be hard things in any role. Um, and you have to get your own kind of comp sense of compromise. Like what do you, what are you willing to compromise in that? And what are you not? I think that um, for me, it's been really important to consider like, is it mission and purpose that's most important in, as a driver? Is it the actual day-to-day of the role? Is it team dynamic and flexibility? Like there's so much to consider when you think about a profession or a career. And so I think like actually just taking the time to be really introspective and say, what it, what are the things that drive you and that are most important to you? And then trying to set opportunities to those things. And frankly, like it's unreasonable again to say that like you get to just pick out of mm-hmm full set of options all the time right but like how if you do find yourself in a um position that's not fulfilling some of those things like where do you have agency to make change or how can you be a part of actually creating a culture you want um within you know either your small department and sets of influence or something broader um i think that especially for early professionals too it's just like get as much diversity of experience as possible like take the internships take projects you know like we work with a lot of student groups um doing like the student consultancy projects and it's like some of these are just bite-sized but all of a sudden you get more exposure to different people different types of functions different types of business environments and again it helps you refine more about like what what works and what doesn't for you um and what, what kind of what kind of um role are you are you really trying to carve out I think from a sustainability perspective there's a lot more available that's like what's sustainability in its title or more explicitly in the space even within the fashion industry but there's also like this move towards integration right so people on our sourcing teams or people on our merchandising teams like they they do the work you know so so much and um, like our sustainability outcomes are so tied to their buy-in, right? And their creativity and them wanting to make an impact. And so I also like to make sure that it's like broad, especially for folks that come and are asking me specifically about like, how do I work in sustainability? Um, sometimes it's challenging that to say like, are you like an analytical wonk? Like, yeah, I feel like you have to do sustainability necessarily. There's There's a place for you too within sustainability functions I have a sustainability analyst that's like wild brilliant yeah but like how do you um how do you like pivot this and actually maybe maybe you should work in finance or business development and make the case for the next circular business model like that's what our biz dev analyst is working on right now with my team like so realizing too that it's like it can go broader mm-hmm. and there's other entryways right. point into like high impact high meaning work Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it also I think bring brings to light um, how it you know in whatever job you you do end up doing um, that you can always make an impact your your own way just you know because your values and what's important to you stay yeah stay there always and so um, no I definitely agree how like you know even like sustainability is a a practice you know so you don't have to work in like a sustainable company to make a sustainable impact um, because there's many other companies who are in need of talented people who also really really care about and like are able to implement sustainable practices because it's something that maybe um, other places didn't even know they wanted or needed. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but yeah, well, um, with that, I am kind of done with my Q and A. So I wanted to thank you tremendously for your time and your kindness in this conversation. Um, it was educational and inspirational. So um, I hope to talk to you again. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for having me again. Um, good luck with your with your programming this week. And um, yeah, please feel free to um, check us out if you don't know us. Um, you can also reach my team at sustainability at thereformation.com if you do have any um, follow-up questions or want like links to anything we talked about. Thank you so much, Kathleen. All right, take care. You too.